Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights. Thanks, Tops, Panini, Upper Deck, Heritage Auctions, Huggins Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Burbank Sports Cards, Compsy.com, and Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication. I was on uh, Off Centered with Brad Jared and Dustin Cooley. Uh, here are some outtakes from that. Uh, grab just 13 minutes just to pass along of uh, somewhat fresh content. With the emergence of some of these other shows, I know we have Mint Collective coming up and we're having bigger shows and also different themed shows where it's not just vendors, but we're having speakers. We're, who, who knows how experiential it'll get because uh, I used to work in the auto show circuit where small towns would have just the vehicles there. But when you went to LA or New York or Chicago, you would have these ride and drives where you can go on Jeeps up and down these hills that they would make. And it was like this ridiculous production. I feel like we're starting to see that. For one, what's your thoughts on the other shows that are emerging that might not even be vendor based, but they are incorporating other aspects of the hobby? And do you see that taking away from the Dallas card show? Because besides the national, it seems like Dallas was the show to go to, but the more options we have, do you, you think it'll be spread too thin at some point? It's possible to be two places at once <laughs> if you count virtual, but if you have a live show, you can't be at the show and at the seminar at the same time. That's what historically was discovered at the early nationals that had all those same kinds of things. Not the celebrity participation, but there's card collectors and even some investors that want to be with the cards. And now in the evening, they want to do something fun. But when it's the show hours, they're not saying, hey, I'm going to go to this other room for a seminar mm -hmm. to uh, listen to something that, unless it's very interactive, they could catch it later on a stream or some kind of a download. So I think the future is going to be some melding of virtual and, and real life kind of experiences at the shows when you got all those people there, there's some amazing content that's unique that can be created. So I, I'm pulling for it, Brad. It's just that you can't be two physical places at the same time. You can't be in the show and, and at the seminar. And that's what my buddies that started the National found out. And so it gradually moved toward card show during the business hours and big social in the evening, which now has included these uh, trade nights. So we'll see. I, I'm hoping it works because I think it'd be a lot of fun. Obviously, it was the Beckett Price Guide. When you look at the card ladders and the market movers and the card hedges, vintage price guide, I feel like those tools are meant to be a current price guide, if you will. Do you look at them that way as a modern day price guide? And do you think that they have legs to be able to take that and run with it, with the technology? The word guide means different things to different people, but we were synthesizing the data that was not readily available or visible. So we're coming up with a price guide price, whereas card ladder, market movers, all these others are basically reporting transactions and drawing That's some inference point, from yeah. that. We were more of the black box that the, the, the transactions were not easily available. We were all over the country. And so then we would synthesize that into a price for every card. That's the amazing thing. When I look back, we we're doing every card in every set. Or, or, you know, at least the demand cards. And uh, most of these others are mainly doing the high demand cards where there's a lot of traction, a, a lot of action, and a lot of it now can be automated okay. and scraped from eBay and these other sources. But back in the day, we, we were doing a lot of brute force and uh, it was exciting and the market was smaller then. There were less cards, less complexity, but still really tough. So when I was looking through the Beckett guides as a kid, I was like, a lot of these cards are $4, $2, which means that there's a lot of effort going to very low end cards. While right now you could automatically track cards that are actually very valuable where it would be worth the effort because there's a lot more money to be made and jobs to be um, had. But back then, if you're tracking all this data for a 50 cent card and a $3 card on the low end, that's just a lot of work. So Kudos well, no, to you. No, it, it, Brad, it's the same amount of work. It's just that for a $3 card or a $3,000 card. Actually, it's a, more work for the $3 card, except not really? in those days because there was a lot of action in $3 cards. Okay. Uh, How much you could charge for a magazine versus a data tool might be different based on the amount of money someone would put into cards. When people went into the card shop in the uh, 80s and 90s, it was do I want to buy cards or do I want to buy a magazine? And not that we were competing, but we were trying to put out a strong product that people said, I, I really want to have this magazine. I want to read it. I want to take it home. I want to look through it. I show it to my friends. So that was our marketing plan. But synthesizing the data is not as hard as gathering the data back in the day was what was really tough. And the first one was really tough because there wasn't a baseline. 
after the first month or the first year, you've got last year's prices and has it gone up or down from, and generally up from the baseline. And so not impossible or we wouldn't have done it, but I had a lot of great teammates and it was a lot of fun for years. It's very difficult to be timely with a print publication nowadays. Mm. It just doesn't make sense for the hottest, fastest moving cards. Investment grade cards. I've heard this thrown around where it's the top 15% of, of a particular card, or maybe someone has it as top 5% or whatever, as far as quality of grade, condition, et cetera. But I've heard you push back on that of it's 15% or better, or it's just not even worth your time. I, I agree with you if that's what it is. I don't think you necessarily have to have the top 15% for it to be declared that's that type of card. Your thoughts on, on that? There's two houses on a block that are for sale. One of them's $500,000 and one of them's a million dollars. Which one's the better deal? You need more information. Right. You need more information. But most people say buy the cheaper house. If it's on the same block with an expensive house, it's got room to go up. Okay. Nobody applies that logic to sports cards. They all go for the bigger card as if that's the better investment. It could be the same card in a better condition. You, you don't know what the future holds. Are these condition premiums, will they hold up? A nine is still a mint card. So to pay 10 times as much for a 10 or some, you know, outrageous multiple, you just have to not be completely emotional about it. You got to figure out what are my goals here? What do I really want to do? And just with a house, how much house do I need? <laughs> a house can be an investment, but you want to buy it. Sure. Yeah, sure. absolutely. So I, I'll talk about Fanatics. I know that's been very controversial because some people see it as an even bigger company stepping in and they're going to change things and only uh, look for the most amount of, of profit. And because of that, they'll ruin the hobby or they'll make it really tough for the average collector. And obviously any business wants to maximize profit. But if you have a long-term vision, it's because you're doing something that's sustainable and you're actually serving people in a way that you can make profit for 20 years, 30 years versus trying to make all the money right away. And then you scare people out of the industry. What, what's your take on the fanatics takeover, knowing their vision, knowing their power as well? Where would you differ on your opinion versus a lot of the collectors that have been in for a long time and are familiar with Panini and Tops and Upper Deck and brands like that? I would say that Michael Rubin, the principal owner of Fanatics and the trading thing for sure, been making lots of money on volume, not on gouging and goosing people with very high margin, but he's selling other people's stuff and he's a, a master marketer. He's made it on volume, not on trying to gouge. He wants more customers. And is he going to uh, make the price points go up a little bit? Yeah, if he makes them go up too much, he's too smart. You can't double prices overnight and expect twice as many people to show up. I think he wants to build a sustainable business, and it's based on volume and making cards and collecting and memorabilia and all the other things he wants to do more mainstream. If that happens, that's good. That what people were turned off by is some of the wild fluctuations of new unopened product. I think they're going to get a handle on that because they're direct to consumer. I'm sure they're going to give some to card shops, but they want to build confidence in the category. That mm -hmm. means making it available, but not overproducing it. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. They didn't double the price of uh, caps and jerseys and all that stuff. They just made it omnipresent and available and provide a good customer service to delivery and distribution. If they do the same thing with cards, I like that. Yeah, absolutely. And getting players involved and having That's them huge. have equity, I think would make it so much more fun because I want players to be involved with these cards because then you're even more connected to the player that you're collecting versus them not even being associated with it or knowing that card exists. Like, I, I don't want a player to be like, oh man, I didn't even know this existed of me. I think it'd be way cooler to see them hold it up on an Instagram post and know that you have that same card. And now you have an extra level of connection with that player. When you think too about Ruben and some of these guys, they're friends with a lot of these players, a lot of these athletes. They're part of the culture, part of that group where it's not as if you have a CEO that's Wizard of Oz behind the curtain and you don't know who they are. These guys are out front and very open and engaging and they do interviews. When you were talking to Dr. Beckett about selling your company, I kept thinking to myself, what if Fanatics reached out to you and said, we would love for you to be on our board of advisors or something like that. Would you entertain any position like that where they really want your perspective and your understanding of the hobby in order to help them? Yes and no. Uh, yes, I like to help. But basically what I do now, I'm a pro bono consultant. So I help my friends and friends of my friends, individuals, organizations, influencers, profit, nonprofit, whatever. 
and just help them in any way I can on a limited basis. I'm not looking to get a job. So I wouldn't be interested in a job. I wouldn't even really interested be in any kind of a permanent consultant, but I'm a troubleshooter and I'm a problem solver. I go over and meet with the Beckett Media guys. And if they've got a problem or something, I'm off the clock, but I'm friends. I want the brand to do well. I want fanatics to do well. My friends at Panini, I meet with them sometimes. So I'm a free agent, emphasis on free. Yeah. If people call me, I generally talk to them. I, I, I was so busy back in the day. I really had a tiger by the tail with the industry and the company was just thriving. But now I, I do have some time. If they said, hey, come up and spend a week with us, I'd say no, but I'll spend an hour or two discussing whatever the issue is that's keeping them up at night. And that, I, I do that several times a week. I've done thousands of meetings like that over the last 20 years. So that's, that's fun, fun, but I'm not going to put the monkey on my back. I'm neither going to be an employee or an employer. I'm retired. Uh, real, but I'm real happy to help. Before, Justin. I'm going to say, no, I won't do that. But here's what I would do. I'd be happy to spend a little bit of time with them. Is there something where these companies are trying to solve this issue and they're coming to you and something where you can say this is a pain point in the hobby or this is something that I see these companies are trying to do. I don't know if there's a theme to the consulting or if it's just random things. I can't knock on their door and say, hey, I'm a consultant. Tell me all your problems. In fact, what might happen is if, if I perceive a problem, that's why I have a podcast. Then I can address it. I'm a quick study or quick talker. It's going to be 15 minutes or less that I'm just going to look at that from my perspective, which, as you pointed out, is a little bit unique because I've been around a lot longer than most people. So, yeah, I'm happy to help and I'll give my perspective and they can say, hey, yeah, that's interesting. If you were a counselor, you can tell people what to do or a trainer and go to a seminar and it's this great technique for doubling your sales. Still a small percentage of the people follow up regardless of whether they paid or not. I want my old company to thrive. I want the industry to thrive. And I want to enjoy what I'm doing. So I make myself available, but it's on my own terms. Not necessarily Beckett grading. Anything in particular with card grading that you'd like to see happen moving forward? Yes. I talked to Jeremy about it, and I'm not going to tell you what it is because yeah. it's, I have a proprietary yeah. idea that I pitched to Jeremy Murray at, at BGS. And I said, I think this is an idea that will really work. And you guys ought to consider it. And they're considering it. Mm -hmm. But it's proprietary, and it, it would give a BGS a competitive advantage. I hope they do it, but I can't twist their arm. I'm not the boss anymore. If I were still the boss, I would have already, but that's okay. So I, I'm not going to get emotionally involved. I'm just going to say, uh, here's an idea and it's for your consideration. Yeah, you're like, Jeremy, you don't have to do it, but my name is on the thing. <laughs> He's got, <laughs> I, I'm, got I'm his hands full. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be bugging him. He, he, there's a lot of dreamers out there and there's doers and the doers already have a lot on their plate. And this would be one more thing on his plate. When the industry's thriving, it's hard to keep up, guys. It's exciting, but it's exhausting, too. It's a lot of pressure on the graders, but it's also a lot of pressure on the grading companies who are about to expand much quicker in order to somewhat keep up with demand. Hey, you're overwhelming me. We can't vet the graders and train them as extensively as maybe we'd want to or would like to. Or even if we could the things we're seeing are changing so rapidly that we can't even keep up. So it's very tough. I thought 2021 was a big catch up year, like an exhale. Hopefully by the end of this year, it'll be very sustainable. Basically, I had an idea for that, but I'm not going to throw it out into the pod sphere for PSA and SGC and any other grading company to consider it. But I had a thought about that that I shared with Jeremy because I happen to have the same name as the grading company, but it was addressing that pain point. If it's a general thing for the industry, then I'm just going to throw it out there in my podcast and let somebody take it and run with it. But if it looks like it be, could be something that Beckett Media could tackle, then I'm going to give them first shot. Some people, if you had a $1,000 budget, you go to a show, you had a $1,000 budget, they want to come back with $1,000 card. And then some people want to come back with $10 cards. Some people want to come back with $100, $10 cards. I want to come back with a thousand one dollar cards. Now they're not really one dollar. She's thrilled. She is <laughs> yeah. not thrilled because it, 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 I, I, could, I could hide the one card. I could hide the ten cards. The hundred maybe I could. If you go through the dollar boxes, I can find a thousand cards out of a dollar box in there because it's like there's guide price, there's value price, but there's the cost of the card. If they're offering, it could be a ten cent card or a ten dollar card in a dollar box. If it's a ten dollar card. I think I'll just take that. Now I'm going to pay for it, 